I am going to share uh, five things that I've learned from Seattle that I uh, think are still relevant today. And uh, while well, you're watching the movie, I, I painted them, so I figured. So number one, uproot the system. And I grew up with a, an organizing model that said, uh, you pick an issue, you organize around that, you can kind of connect it to other issues, but if you start talking about the system, you'll lose people. And, you know, in Seattle, we were inspired a lot by the Zapatistas, by stuff going on in Europe, and we actually named, we named the system different ways, called it corporate globalization, corporate capitalism. Uh, and the fact that we actually told the narrative that the system was wrong, connected it with a lot of the things that impact people in their daily lives, I think we disprove the, the, the orthodoxy of single issue organizing. And so I think it's actually critical that we, you know, we all know this shit's connected. And so often, many of my friends, especially work in nonprofits and unions, who know a systemic problem, they're afraid to actually say it. And so they don't give us a, a narrative to explain what's going on in the world. They just talk about one little piece. And I think we also, uh, the other thing I see that happens is, you know, those of us who are doing workplace or community organizing, we talk about, uh, we talk about, you know, people are being foreclosed, people are being, uh, you know, breathing toxic air. And we don't actually say, and this is part of an economic and political system which we actually need to get to the root of and overthrow. So one set of people are talking about the foreclosures and the, the air coming out of the refinery down the road. And then the people who are talking about, you know, a radical and systemic analysis are doing disconnected organizing, you know, kind of going after global capitalism, you know, one cop at a time or whatever. And so, to me, I think those, we actually need to mix those up. We need to, you know, fight around foreclosures, but also say what we know, which is that this is a systemic problem and we need to, you know, we're fighting right now in San Francisco, we're doing major housing fighting against foreclosures, so we need to say, we're going to save the DeAngelis' family on Bernal Hill because they're due to be uh, uh, foreclosed in, in, uh, at the end of this month. But this is because of the banks and this is because of an economic system and to actually talk about those thing, two things together. So that's number one. The second one is we need to, my visual, we need to organize with strategy. And to me this is key. And. Uh, you know, I think if we, I think the Occupy movement is the most significant space in my lifetime where we can actually build a mass movement to not just, you know, push back a little bit of breathing space, but to actually try and destroy some of these institutions and make things so that kids growing up now in the next generation cannot just be fighting defensive battles in a world with a global empire and a crumbling ecological systems but can actually start to heal and rebuild things. So I, I think we need to recognize this as the best chance we have probably in our lifetimes and throw down as hard as we can. And the way we throw down is not just you know by being courageous or militant, but it's by being smart. The people who keep us in the places we are are incredibly smart and strategic. They have study, they have uh, uh, institutions that study strategy about how to keep us in our place. They spend billions of dollars on public relations to create narratives to keep us down. They're incredibly smart and effective. They study what we do. You know, they're watching Occupy and they're figuring out, okay, what are the weak points? How can we take them down? How can we split it? Uh, scare the public away from them? So if we want to actually fight back, we have to be as smart as them and we have to create a culture of strategy uh, and not just a few smarty pants folks who've been organizing for 10 or 20 years or went to college or something, but actually where all of us in our general assemblies are having a high level of understanding and uh, discussion about, you know, how does change happen? How can we uh, strategize that? And, and I'm going to uh, call out a few different challenges I see to us being strategic. There's a lot of discussion about it. Uh, and I guess the first is around, uh, there's been a lot of debate around nonviolence, and I feel like, uh, you know, I identify within the tradition of revolutionary nonviolence to some degree, but I think one of the worst enemies of strategic, what I would call people power action, has been some of the advocates of nonviolence. Uh, Dave Dellinger, who's a revolutionary nonviolent uh, 
organizer who passed a few years ago, he wrote 40 years ago in the late 60s that it's absurd that both the privileged elite and the timid moderates have become spokesmen for nonviolence. In the general debasement of the word, nonviolence has suffered. It may be necessary for those of us who are anxious to preserve the humanistic sensitivity and content of the revolution to find another word to sum up what we are advocating. So, and this is what I find when I'm, you know, arguing for what I would say. Let's let's debate which what tactics and strategies make sense. What's going to win stuff? And you know, when I argue for a nonviolent approach to mass direct action, you know, the other people who are using the word nonviolence are Jean Kwan, the mayor of Oakland, who just sicked her cops with chemical weapons on a bunch of unarmed protesters. You know, and then there's also honestly a lot of people in positions of privilege or people who aren't actually serious about upholding the status quo. So I would I would like to push folks if you advocate for a nonviolent approach, I would argue that uh, I would argue that we need to ha define uh, a militant, a revolutionary, and a very aggressive. Uh, and I would actually uh, agree with David Dillinger. I actually don't use the term nonviolence because it's been so taken over by liberals and by people who wish to avoid conflict and that you can't actually make change without engaging in conflict and that's the core of nonviolent direct action or people power and so i think the the terms of nonviolence the legacies of gandhi and king are really often misused by folks in ways that cheapens the word so i'm i am arguing for abandoning the word and for those who actually see and to me the the core principle is that uh we can't actually win change or overthrow capitalism or the state by uh, by fighting them militarily. So to me then, okay, well what are the other methods that are available? And they're cultural, political, economic, uh, those forms. So to me, I would call that people power. And I think nonviolence sort of fetishizes a different, a particular style of people power. But I think people power is broader. And also when folks, you know, are looking for their Gandhian, pure nonviolence, they often uh, distance themselves from the people power movements around the world that I've had the honor of getting to work with, like folks in Bolivia who essentially are mass, mass unarmed nonviolent direct action. But yeah, that people scuffle with cops and throw a few things. But the core of it and the core of what's overthrown a lot of dictatorships in the last 20 years is people power. So I'm gonna I'm pushing on nonviolence advocates to, to actually uh, you know organize and lead by example, and also to to loosen up and let go of your fetishization of different tactics. The second thing I'd like to talk about is diversity of tactics, and this was uh, after Seattle, uh, a lot of a sector of the anarchist scene and radical scene, partly feeling some rigidity of advocates of nonviolence. Uh, rejected discussions of which tactics are strategic and rejected making any action agreements around which tactics we will or won't use for particular actions. And the term, uh, the term diversity of tactics was coined around Quebec City and it's a brilliant framing or branding term as they say in advertising because uh, who here is against diversity, right? Uh, but what that what that has done is it's created uh, it's created a series of mass actions post Seattle uh, where people have actually shut down discussion about which tactics are strategic and which ones aren't and so that means they're you know the core of strategy is figuring out what do you do in what order you know to fight the folks who are going to try and you know split you beat you up divide you. And when you have a, a political principle says that we refuse to discuss or make agreements about which tactics, uh, you shut down your ability to be strategic. So actually, I believe a lot of the space that was opened up by Seattle has actually been shut down by diversity of tactics together with a, a, a set of organizing practices that have not served a bunch of very courageous, smart folks very well. And. Uh, has gotten our butts kicked in a series of actions since 2000 and that we actually need to, I think we need to actually abandon diversity of tactics. 
I was briefly in Hong Kong for the WTO in 2005 and ran with the farmers and workers organizations of Korea who are not at all nonviolent. They're probably the most militant uh, street movement on the planet. They fight cops and win. Uh, but they absolutely uh, make agreements about which tactics they will and won't use. And they push people to stick to them. And that's how you know they're able to overthrow dictatorships, why they're able to, to fight and win. So I'm, I'm pushing on folks that whatever tactics you like or whatever you think about violence or nonviolence, that uh, we need movements that can actually have discussions about which ones are strategic, when to use them, and make agreements about them. And, and as an anarchist, I think that's a core anarchist principle is we make agreements with each other. And that's the core of uh, and voluntary agreements. That's the alternative to having authoritarian structures that impose from above. If you live in a collective house, you don't want to have diversity of dishes, do you? You want to have <laughs> some agreement about, you know, it's like, okay, we'll do them sometimes or whatever. Uh, but I, I'm pushing back on that. In our Occupy San Francisco, we've actually agreed to uh, an action agreement that doesn't even use the word nonviolence. I mean, we say our actions are nonviolent, but and to try and circumvent, to make it clear that we don't pass judgment on uh, property destruction. I've been involved in many nonviolent actions that involve tearing down fences and destroying property. But we say, uh, you know, we'll only use property destruction if it's strategic and we agree to it through our GA and Action Council, you know, such as breaking into houses that are foreclosed. So, uh, an, an encouragement to, for people to find ground on that. And I guess the last thing I'll look at is I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of folks who are pushing different strategies, and one I'd like to call out is Deep Green Resistance. Derek Jensen uh, and his crew are setting up a national network of groups that are advocating a very specific strategy called Decisive Ecological Warfare. And um, and why I'm calling it out is because I think it's it has the potential to close a lot of political space. I see it sharing a lot with the. The, uh, the weather underground, in that there are a group of folks who actually see the ecological crisis as incredibly dire and that we need to stop about it, stop, do something about it, that our tactics and our movements haven't had enough impact yet, you know, which I agree with, that we need to be strategic and be incredibly, you know, escalate and be serious about it. I agree with all that, but their strategy is to, uh, to circumvent the people power part, the part where, and in my view, the only way to make those kinds of, the kinds of systemic changes we need is to involve large numbers of people in the streets. We're talking about hundreds of thousands and millions, and also to involve uh, a majority of public support. So Deep Green Resistance, you know, like quoting from their website, they said, are you willing to set aside your last fierce dream that a brave uprising of millions strong uh, will make change. The existence of those brave millions is the empty hope of the desperate and they're not coming to our rescue. So they're saying, we're similar to what I believe the weather underground did, which is we're not gonna have a mass movement to make change, so we're gonna try and short circuit that and have a small cadres of people who will, in their case, they believe the the system system is civilization itself, which is hard to build a mass movement around, so that might be partly why. But they believe that small group, small cadres of folks around the country can physically destroy uh, the infrastructure of industrial civilization, and that's how we'll make change and stop uh, ecological catastrophe, and without actually uh, addressing the underlying social and power relationships. So I'm just calling that out. Moving on, very quickly. Uh, next one is build people power. And that's uh, the part that I think we can't, there's no way to get around that. And to me, a lot of the debates we're having in Occupy right now about how do we actually involve large numbers of people? How do we keep this political space open? We had a little bit of a honeymoon, and now you know the folks who are fighting, who control the media, are trying to figure out how to close down that space. So to me, when I'm looking at how I organize, and uh, I'm fairly ambitious, so I'm looking at you know, we have a neighborhood Occupy. We've actually gone door to door, uh, talked to everyone facing foreclosure, and we're trying to mobilize that whole neighborhood, and then we're trying to organize all the other neighbors. That's one example. 
you know, similar stuff around student mobilization to stop the 1% gutting education. Uh, how can we actually involve tens of thousands and eventually hundreds of thousands of people, not just at rallies, but actually engaging in different levels of uh, direct action? And uh, the fourth one, which I like a lot, is called Experiment in the Laboratory of Resistance. And to me, the, one of the lessons, uh, as someone who's been involved for a bit, is that you know, if those of us who've been doing it for a little bit knew how to change things precisely, it wouldn't be such a damn mess. So that, you know, our strategies and how to change things is actually an open question and what we desperately need is for people to, you know, look back and figure out what's worked, but also very much to innovate and come up with new forms. And particularly, uh, those in power are incredibly skilled at figuring out what we do and how to subvert it or, uh, marginalize it. So it's like if we're in a boxing match with the system, you can't keep throwing the same left hook you did in the last two social movements or decades. You actually have to be on your feet and constantly rethinking and innovating new things to do. And the last one is that we have to tell stories and that the core of how they keep us in our place is through narratives that reinforce the status quo and the core of how we resist is by telling, uh, you know, unlike the folks in power, we don't have fancy PR firms that come up with fabricated narratives, you know, we actually have to uh, tell our own stories. So, you know, the story we're telling right now, I mentioned earlier, uh, there's a family, second generation family that's lived on Bernal Hill. Uh, they are in, in the process of being foreclosed. They work hard, they've got three kids, and the banks are trying to make a buck by kicking them out of their house at the end of this month. You know, and this is uh, uh, banks that were bailed out. That bailout money could have been used to bail out every homeowner in America, and then it still would have gone to the damn banks, but instead <laughs> they got it directly because our system's run by the 1%. No, and so, and uh, the Mr. De Angelis has been speaking at our rallies and telling a very compelling story. So, to me, uh, we have to be incredible storytellers and special call out to folks who are uh, performers, artists, and musicians, and that uh, folks in creative arts, I think, have a, a particular skills at how to tell stories and communicate at the heart and the gut and not just, you know, facts and figures. So, uh, I think it's narratives and stories that we have to become expert at telling and also uh, at deconstructing our opponent's narrative and stories. There's a, a strategy tool called the battle of the story where you actually do an analysis of your story and then their story. And so we actually have to tell a winning story, win over the majority of society with our narrative that reflects our values. and. Uh, overthrow the United States government and global capitalism. Thank you. <laughs> See, three very quick things. One, uh, someone mentioned privilege and nonviolence. I am critical that the loudest voices often calling for nonviolence are out of privilege, but uh, just to be very clear, uh, the history of nonviolent action and nonviolent revolution is very much by uh, poor folks, working class folks, and folks of color. My main inspirations right now are the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, low-wage immigrant migrant workers who have taken on the largest food corporations on the planet and consistently yeah. um, uh, Second, I guess, I would just uh, push people to Debating what's violent, what's not violent, and which one we like is is uh, has been a pretty unproductive frame for the last 12 years. So I think what people are doing, which is to actually maybe make an agreement to not talk about that, because I find uh, it doesn't move us forward. So if we could actually try and chat, try and have a conversation in which we just talk about what's strategic. And when I ask that question myself. You know, I mean, one of the questions is, who do we want to be working with either in this formation or in this action? So, you know, the, 
I think that's key. So who, who, who will be in the streets with us if we choose different kinds of tactics? And the second part is, how do we keep majority support of our community or of the 99%, which the 1% is going to try and push it and win the 1%? And finally, uh, what's most effective in asserting our power to win? <laughs> Thank you, David. Um, we'll be grappling with that over the next few weeks, and um, uh, as, as we said early today, that we saw this as potentially a pilot or prototype series for something more long-running, so we hope you'll join us again and, and maybe even join us in person before too long. Thanks so much for all your work, man. <laughs>